surprised you came back. The training was really terrible yesterday, wasn't it? Uh, it was terrific, and today is going to be just as good, if not better. So uh, let me give you a couple of uh, housekeeping tips. The um, bathrooms are right outside to the left. Uh, lunch is on your own. Uh, please be back in a timely fashion. It's really important we break. Tom's very good at breaking at exactly noon or very close to and getting back here exactly at 1 o'clock, so I ask that you do that. Uh, cell phones. Anybody have one? Okay. Please, please, a couple of things. One, please don't do any texting. Um, secondly, if you get a phone call, and we all know what kind of work we do, there will be phone calls or people who need you. Please be respectful and just step outside if you have to make a phone call or if you have to receive a phone call. Uh, lastly, uh, I'm even more upset than I was yesterday when Blake Easter Seals gave gift bags to everyone. Now Danville has gift bags for everyone. And so the folks at Tucson Residence Foundation have asked me, what did you do for your agency? So if you're with Tucson Residence Foundation, raise your hand. Okay, now look under your seat. There are keys to, there's keys to nothing. There's keys to absolutely nothing. Uh, but we'll make that up to you. Anyway, let me get on to Tom. Tom is going to spend uh, the better part of today with most of you, and I know there's quite a few supervisors, managers, directors, depending on your title, uh, to kind of follow up on yesterday. And I know I've gotten some really great feedback about yesterday. Um, Tom's got a very long bio, which I'll let him uh, and give you an abbreviated version. And um, i trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, no, just enjoy the day. Uh, and uh, we will see you at the first break. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Tom Pomeranz. Give me one second, friends. Anyway, those of you who were with me yesterday, welcome back. Delighted, delighted to have you here. Those of you who weren't with me yesterday, Welcome. We're going to rock and roll today. And uh, as I'm sure some of you heard that uh, weren't here yesterday, may have heard from those who were, I'm pretty provocative, okay? Uh, and I'm going to talk about that for a moment. This session is, is even more provocative than yesterday's session. I train on 50-minute CEU hours. I go for 50. I break for 10. And I try to be very precise. We'll say that we started at uh, 9.10, so we'll stop at 10. Who in this row will let me know when it's 10 o'clock in this row? You're on. Okay, good. Just like this. And again, as I said yesterday, there's some people in here who smoke. They have the addiction. You do too. Okay. So that's good. Because if you don't, they'll start throwing water bottles at you at 10.01. Okay, you all have name tags on. Can I see them? Please put them someplace where I can see them so I don't point at you. And uh, I'm going to be calling on all of you a lot. I'll do my best, right, when you were here yesterday. Do you remember who I said I call on the most? Back row. Yep, yeah. yeah, i got to work with you. So, hey, you guys are all from uh, Tucson, right? I'm mostly in the back. So I'm going to call on all of you a lot. When I call on people, if you don't want to answer, you don't know the answer, you're shy, who remembers? What can you say? Pass. Good. And I'll go to the next person. The harder you try to give me the right answer, the better you're going to do on the test, okay? So I have a name tag on. I'm going to take it off in a, in a little moment here because it tends to fall off and that will bother you. When you have a question, and you guys who were here yesterday did really good, raise your hand. This session is far more challenging than yesterday's session in terms of its complexity and difficulty. So if, if you find yourself confused by 9.30, by 10 o'clock, you won't even know your name, okay? 
Now, can you all do me a favor? I want you to turn around and look at that door back there. Can you all turn around? Okay, you all see the door. Okay, good. When you leave, that's the door you're going to be going through. If you don't understand this stuff on this side of the door, you're not going to get it on the other side of the door. You know better than I whether you're getting it or not. And if you're not, raise your hand because we can work through it, okay? You won't bother me at all if you raise your hand and I stop and so forth. These chairs are not the best in the world. If you feel that you would be more comfortable standing up, don't hesitate. Just go over there to the back. You're welcome to pay, stand up if you're more comfortable. Uh, I think I covered it other than a bit of introduction for those of you who were with me yesterday. I apologize for reintroducing myself, but it's the appropriate thing to do. So a little bit about me. I have been doing this for 50 years, and uh, obviously as I look around the room, longer than the vast majority of you are old. And my, and it's always difficult for me to do an introduction for myself. I, I prefer not to. It's even worse when I have somebody else do it. So my bachelor's and master's is in the field of intellectual disabilities. My doctorate is in mental health administration. And my postdoctoral work is in clinical psychology. I'm very lucky. I've worked in all three fields of our industry. We have the governmental entity, the not-for-profit entity, and the for-profit group. In the governmental sector, I was an assistant superintendent of treatment of two large state psychiatric hospitals. I also served as uh, an assistant superintendent of rehabilitation of a large state operated developmental center. In the not-for-profit sector, I was an executive director of an ARC. Do you have ARCs in Arizona, guys? They provide, they provide services? Yeah. Okay, they're providers, yeah. And this was an ARC in Indiana. I was, it was really strange. I don't share this frequently. Um, the person I reported to, you know, as an executive director, you report usually to the president of the board. My president was Dan Quayle. Now, some of you are so young, you've never heard of the guy, but that, that was, the, honestly, he was the president of my board. And then, excuse me, in the for, oh, also in the not-for-profit sector, I was director of continuing education at St. Louis University Medical Center and an assistant professor of top mental health administration. And then finally, uh, in the for-profit sector for 13 years, my longest stint, other than doing this, I was chief clinical officer and uh, director of operations for the second largest for-profit provider in the country. We operated in 13 states, focusing predominantly on people who were coming out of state institutions. Right? Starting 1999, I started my own company, and I've been training full-time uh, ever since. Now, if I go back and look at my history, I've always considered myself a teacher and a trainer, no matter what role I have held. I am not your typical talking head. I spend two to three days a week actually coaching on site, which is very relevant because that's what we're going to be talking about today. You are here because I have deemed you an instructor, a trainer of the staff. Your training department is not going to be training the staff. The ultimate training is really going to occur with you as managers and supervisors, and that's what we're going to be talking about, as well as those of you who are here uh, from QA so forth. Um, I said I've been doing this for 50 years, and just, just a little comment. And obviously, over 50 years, I've seen incredible changes in our industry, incredible changes. I can tell you unequivocally, what we are going through now makes everything pale in the past. I just want you to know that the service industry likely will not look the same five years from today that it's looking now. With the vast majority of all the state operated developmental centers in the country closing. I spend about 30% of all my time in California. They are closing all their state operated developmental centers. You understand what that means to these states, right? People coming out who have tremendous medical needs, receiving nourishment by tube and uncontrolled seizures, and people having extreme conduct issues. So the providers community has to get ready. We're also seeing the elimination of group homes. My guess is within a very short period of time, probably the next seven or eight years, there'll be very, very few group homes in this country. Uh, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, right? Because of the new rule, though it has been extended by three years, um, you can anticipate in one of the most significant changes, and you may, I believe Arizona's already there, everybody will have their own bedroom. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal, but probably 60% of all the people in our system have to share a bedroom. You can anticipate probably within five years or so, 
90% of all residences, in my opinion, will have no more than three people in them. When in fact, you know, the majority of residences have six, seven, and eight people in them throughout the country. So huge changes, that's just a little bit, huge changes are occurring throughout the country and our service system will not look the same. Now, what did I do yesterday? And I just gotta bring you up to date. And by the way, for me, these changes are really exciting. I mean, these are just like really neat. Uh, here's another one. You can anticipate that all site-based day programs, with rare exception, will be eliminated within the next five years. And we will no longer be allowed under the Olmstead Act, as well as the new Medicaid rule, to continue to segregate people because they have an intellectual disability. So the continued segregation that we have will basically stop. We already know it is against the law under Olmstead, but the laws are not being enforced. But we're moving forward uh, with the new Medicaid rule so that agencies who continue to segregate will no longer be funded. So those are huge changes. Now, if you're sitting here and you know you're not responsible for day supports, you're saying, that sounds like a great idea, right? Nothing wrong with change, as long as it doesn't affect me, right? Those of you who provide day supports, you're thinking, great idea. Everybody should have their own bedroom. No more than two or three people per home. Everybody should be able to choose who they live with and where they live. That sounds fine, unless you're the operator of a seven-person residence, and that all, that all changes. So these are exciting times, very, very exciting times. Uh, what, we're going to be oh, what we talked about yesterday was supported routines. Uh, that was recorded yesterday, video recorded. Those of you who were not here, I urge you to look at that recording or you are going to find yourself in a blessed corner because I stirred those staff up a lot. If you, if you don't believe me, just ask anyone who was here yesterday. And those of you who are managers and su supervisors are going to have your staff beating on you about tons of things and you're going to say, well, what, what, what? So it was recorded. Those recordings are available to you. I urge you to go and and review those recordings so you know what your staff heard yesterday. It's really important. Supported routines yesterday, we basically focused on nothing about me without me, just to do a few of the maxims. Never do anything by yourself, but then go to the bathroom and smoke a cigarette. Anytime the staff hand touches anything, we told the staff, you always ask yourself, why have you elected to do that, to move that item, pick that up, versus use this hand as an empowering hand? These hands with our staff cannot be do for hands, they have to be do with hands. To care for is to do for that sympathy. The men and women who we support do not want nor need our sympathy. Everybody got it? To care for is to do for that sympathy. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the men and women who we support do not want nor need our sympathy. To care about is to do with. I'm just giving you some of the themes of yesterday. And that is the expectation. I think there was general acknowledgement that the vast majority of the people who are being supported by your five agencies have been denied an opportunity to participate in their life. We said that there's a general expectation that people should be involved in all aspects, regardless of their level of support need. We should never be using their disability as the excuse or explanation why they do not participate that is merely an indication of the level of support that is required to participate. So some agencies need to start shifting their culture. Now, why did I take a few minutes to do this? Because you are the ones that the staff are dependent upon to put tools in their toolbox to make that happen. We cannot, as managers and supervisors, be the obstacle to making that happen. We have to be the facilitator to make that happen. Everybody with me? Okay, it's like a really important, important point. Okay, let's go ahead and start in terms of, in terms of this coaching <coughs> concept. And I've got lots and lots of detail for you. I'd like to start off first because I think some of you may not be familiar with what is called Tom's Laws. I don't know how they publish them, but I would like you to be familiar with these. Number one. The size of a person's bed is proportional to their IQ. Oh, you will have, God, I nearly forgot something. You will have available to you all of these slides, okay? They will be distributed to the four directors. Bob already has them as the fifth agency, but they will be provided to your agency and available to you. I don't want you to kill yourself writing down tons of detail from these. I want you to go away understanding the principles. I want you to go away better understanding your role as a teacher and coach to the staff. If we get that, we got it, okay? That's important. 
So the size of a person's bed is proportional to their IQ. And I'm assuming a lot of these laws have been withheld from you and you're not aware of them. So that usually when you go to a residence and people have IQs under 70, you will note that that results in having a twin bed. According to the American Bedding Council, something like 90% of all adults of normal intelligence sleep in a double bed and larger. People with IQs of 70 and less, approximately 70 or 80% of those people sleep in a twin bed. So you can see the issue, bless you. The frequency of illness is positively correlated with the number of nurses employed. Whenever I go to an organization, they have people who have a lot of medical issues. You will note that they employ a lot of nurses or contract with them. It is clear to me that nurses cause disease because when you go to agencies and people are very healthy, they seldom have any nurses in their staff. Next, when speaking, the receiver's comprehension is positively correlated with the speaker's voice 